Hi, I'm Amit Denny from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press and Genome Research. Last week, we hit the 85th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, and the topic this year was biological timekeeping. Joining me today is Felix Neff from EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. Thanks for being here, and welcome back to Cold Spring Harbor. Yeah, thanks uh, for the time. Uh, before we talk about research, I would like to briefly ask you about your background, where you're from and what your path was to becoming a scientist. Okay, yeah, let's, let's do that. So I'm, uh, I'm Swiss, uh, born in, in Geneva, and uh, I did actually uh, study physics uh, in, in, in Zurich, um, and then did a PhD uh, still in, in physics at uh, the Polytechnical School in, in Lausanne, where I then came back to. And in uh, those days, I was uh, interested in uh, studying low dimensional magnetism from a kind of theoretical point of view. It was the time of the, the high temperature, uh, you know, superconductivity, et cetera. But I then decided uh, I need to do something else for my postdoc. And uh, I had some friends that told me a lot about, you know, how exciting uh, molecular biology uh, has, has had become in those years. And so I, uh, went for a postdoc at uh, the Rockefeller University in New York, where there's this center for uh, studies in physics and biology, where basically physicists and, and biologists can meet. And, and in particular, I think physicists can try to, you know, immerse themselves into, into a, a biological environment and, and you know, learn a, a lot and, and, and contribute their sort of skills uh, and, and approaches. And, and that's where, um, I was then working with uh, Marcelo Magnasco, uh, but as, as a postdoc, I also started collaborating there with uh, Michael Young, and he introduced me basically to the problem of uh, of circadian rhythms, and it was the early days of you know gene expression analysis uh, in, in, in Drosophila basically heads, and, and for the first time we saw you know how, how much cycling there there actually is sort of genome wide. Um, and, and that sort of uh, problem then kept, you know, interesting me because for physicists, uh, you know, the clock is kind of particularly interesting because there's, there's an oscillator, obviously, at, at the core, and physicists love oscillators. And, and so when I then came back to Switzerland, where I uh, applied for a, a computational biology position at the Cancer Institute in Lausanne, uh, I immediately got in touch with uh, Uli Schibler, uh, and that's where I then learned a lot about, uh, you know, this, the mammalian part of, of circadian biology, and, and we ended up collaborating uh, for many years on, you know, problems of, of, of gene expression rhythms uh, in, in liver and, and other tissues, applying then all sorts of, you know, the, the newer generation of techniques with uh, the, the chip sequencing and, and, and the RNA-seq and, and the DNA's one hypersensitivity. Uh, and so that basically, uh, you know, is my trajectory into, uh, into chronobiology. And I, I still now contribute uh, with my own lab on, on the sort of follow-up questions uh, related to, to gene expression analysis uh, and, and chronobiology. Well, you must be pretty happy with the recent technological developments, I guess, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's great. You know, uh, I mean, obviously, it's completely changed what 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 we what we can do now, and and uh, yeah, I think I mean, and very recently, I guess, with with the single cell, uh, you know, approaches. Uh, which was basically what I talked about at, at the meeting. I think this this opens yet another sort of dimension. Um, and yeah, so I, I can summarize a little bit the talk. Uh, if I say you had a great story on space-time organization of the circadian physiology. So for those who might have missed, uh, would you mind giving us a brief summary, please? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I talked about uh, a project we, we had uh, jointly with uh, uh, the, the Itzkovitz lab at, at the Weizmann Institute. And it, it was really, I think, uh, an exciting uh, kind of opportunity uh, to, to dive into this idea of, you know, space-time gene expression programs um, in the liver. 
And so the, the reason we, we met, I think, is because uh, we, we realized, I mean, Shalef Itzkovitz developed this, this technique to, to look at spatial organization of liver uh, gene expression. And, and we had been working for years on, on the purely temporal aspect of liver gene expression. And then we realized there's an opportunity to, to combine both. So his expertise on liver zonation and, and how you know uh, liver biology is organized along the, 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 the lobule and, and the so-called uh, central portal axis, which they had studied very nicely with a new uh, approach to reconstructing these spatial profiles, but they had done that at you know, a, a single time point. And when I saw this, I said, well, look, Shalef, we have to, you know, introduce the, the temporal dimension in, into this problem. And, and we then uh, teamed up and uh, basically uh, performed this essentially in a first step atlas type of project, which was uh, about just uh, looking for the first time into both space and time uh, gene expression in, in the liver. And we really didn't know what, what to expect because uh, if you see a, a rhythm in a, in a bulk analysis, you, you don't know whether the, the entire you know, tissue uh, cycles in, in that fashion or maybe only sub areas. Uh, and, and you could imagine all sorts of sort of complex situations where you know, at bulk you might see a, a very shallow rhythm mm -hmm. but because maybe different regions in the lobule are even kind of you know canceling each other or perhaps only you know a very tiny group of cells in the liver has has high amplitudes and the rest of the cells have have no amplitude and then when you look at it in bulk you you see you see a low amplitude so we really had no no idea and uh so we did this experiment where we you know, then uh, took this single cell approach uh, where you perfuse livers uh, and, and we use a relatively low uh, you know, sampling uh, temporally because the experiment is obviously quite complicated. But so it's, it uses a perfusion uh, based approach where you then you know, perfuse your livers and, and uh, get the cells and run them on. Uh, we, did, we did this 10x genomics. And the, the, the neat trick that Shalev had uh, developed, uh, which goes under the name of spatial reconstruction, is basically to uh, use landmark genes that you know have, have this uh, zonated pattern, so are more expressed on one side of the lobule compared to the other, or vice versa. Or there's also these mid lobular genes that peak in the middle. So if you have enough of these, you don't need so many, but let's say, you know, hand, I mean, 10 or 12. Uh, and these are highly expressed genes. Then even in the single cells, you have enough, you know, reads that you can sort of uh, measure the expression patterns of those genes in the single cell. And, and uh, the signature of these 10 or 12 landmark genes in each single cell then determines where it came from in the lobule. Yes. And so you do this with all the cells and, and, and then you can uh, do a kind of averaged profile after you've uh, you know, assigned all the cells and, and, and basically bin them into, into layers and, and then you can average the, that and, and obtain genome-wide uh, spatial profile. And then if you also do it over time, then you get space and time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, you know, we, we went through all these, these different patterns, uh, not knowing really what to expect. And, and so we had to develop also a kind of analysis that is, was tailored uh, to detect this kind of space-time rhythms. Um, and we, we did that with a mixed effect model. And uh, it, well, it, it I mean, the data, first of all, looked, looked sort of very good because uh, uh, a lot of the rhythmic genes we, we knew from before, we actually found rhythmic and a lot of the zonated genes that we knew from before we found zonated, but there was this group of gene that was both rhythmic and zonated. And there were 
kind of two flavors of those genes, so the, the ones we termed Z plus R and the ones we termed Z cross R. And actually the Z plus R were much more numerous. So maybe for this summary, we can uh, not talk about the Z cross Rs. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Z plus Rs are genes where time and space act multiplicatively. I mean, they're called plus, but actually it's a plus in, in log. Um, transform data. So it's, it's actually a, a multiplicative ex, uh, effect on in the space of mRNA levels. Uh, uh, an additive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but essentially, uh, that was very already very interesting because, you know, it, a lot of uh, previous studies basically found a lot of rhythmic genes in the liver. And so what we found is, you know, a bit more than a third of those genes that uh, we study in chronobiology and, and, and are nicely rhythmic, they are actually strongly zonated in, in, in the liver. So, you know, they're not flat in the tissue. They're either like this or, or, or like this. Uh, and we then looked at, uh, you know, how the, the, the sort of functions of, of those genes and, and how uh, liver physiology is organized uh, al along the day in, in this kind of space-time uh, coordinate system where you have now also the, the genes that are uh, expressed centrally or the genes that ex uh, express portally. Uh, and and what, we, what we saw is, I mean, a, a couple of things that, you know, we, we knew and, and made sense like uh, that, you know, processes like, um, like gluconeogenesis, uh, which are temporarily regulated by, you know, genes like, like uh, PCK1. So for example, Katya Lamia has, has studied this very carefully. Uh, and, and so this, this process of, of uh, gluconeogenesis is strongly zonated portally in, in the liver, but it, it also uh, goes up and down temporarily and that occurs, you know, towards the end of the, the fasting period in, in, in the liver. So there was a lot related to, you know, carbohydrate metabolism that we kind of expected or, or knew about it. There was uh, obviously in the, in the liver, there's a lot of lipid uh, metabolism going on. And, and so we also saw you know, when, when, when are lipids used, uh, used or burned. Uh, and, and where that occurs in the liver. So it turns out that it occurs also uh, portally. Uh, but uh, other processes that we really didn't know so well yet or were not associated with this sort of space time patterns were things like uh, protein synthesis. Uh, so that occurs on the other side of the lobule predominantly, uh, so centrally. So we saw a lot of, uh, you know, uh, an excess of, of ribosomal protein gene expression centrally and also, and, and globally there was more protein turnover centrally. So also, you know, components of the proteasome were expressed uh, centrally. Um, and so that we didn't really know about. Uh, and also another sort of new finding was actually in part related to, to protein synthesis and, and turnover, uh, which and was linked with uh, uh, heat shock proteins. Oh. So heat shock proteins, uh, we we knew that there was a temporal uh, aspect of, of uh, you know, heat shock uh, protein gene expression. This was uh, studied by by Uli Schibler, uh, reported the first time by by his lab. Uh, and, and so during the times in the liver where there's a lot of protein synthesis, uh, which coincides with the, the feeding uh, period, uh, you need a lot of kind of chaperone activities. So, so that occurs during the, for mice, uh, during the uh, daytime or their active time, which is actually in reality nighttime, but it's, it's when they, they eat and, and are active. Uh, but, uh, these heat shock uh, gene expression patterns have, had never been sort of uh, connected with, with zonation. And what we actually saw is that there were two types of, of uh, profiles for the, the heat shock transcription, or sorry, the heat shock fact, uh, proteins. Part of the, the heat shock proteins were clearly biased centrally, 
And these were all the cytoplasmic uh, histone proteins. And so that sort of, you know, matched this idea that there's more sort of protein synthesis and turnover centrally. But there was another group of histone proteins that was clearly biased portally. But uh, this was not sort of, you know, random because it turned out that uh, all the, the, the heat shock proteins that were expressed portally were associated with uh, ER, or the, you know, known to be localized in, in the ER, both the, the chaperones and their co-chaperones. And, and so uh, that then uh, relates to the, the, the fact that there's a lot of protein secretion in the liver. And, and that occurs actually on the portal side. So for the, the heat shock genes, depending on the subcellular localization, you had, we, had, we found either a central or, or a portal uh, uh, pattern. So, so that was sort of, you know, in a nutshell, what I, what I kind of presented. I think it, it shows that, I mean, the liver has, has this sort of rich, you know, both spatial and temporal um, compartmentalization. Uh, so it has this, in a way, this kind of double way of, you know, compartmentalizing biological functions. Um, and uh, there's also other results that I didn't have time to, to present at, at the meeting, but we, we then followed up a little bit on, on a, also a new finding that uh, relates to the rhythmic activity of wind signaling, actually, in, 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 in the liver. So wind is strongly zonated. That was known because wind is actually kind of master organizer of liver zonation. But what we described here for the first time is that the, the activity is also rhythmic and peaks towards the end of the, the, the fasting period also. And uh, we did a bit of SM fish analysis to identify basically the, 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 the putative cause of this rhythmic wind signaling uh, because we found that when we looked at endothelial cells mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, on centrally localized i mean there's also endothelial cells elsewhere but the, the centrally localized endothelial cells secreted uh, or let's say expressed uh, two wind ligands in, in, a, in, a, in a rhythmic pattern that sort of matched the, the, the activity time that, that we uh, found for, for wind signaling. Actually, I was going to ask now that you mentioned wind, and actually in the talk, you mentioned the French flag model. Uh, yes. I was curious whether there are a lot of commonalities between, uh, say, morphogens and development and what you're observing now. Yeah. So, um, well, this is exactly uh, ties into what I, I, I just uh, described very briefly. With, yeah, with with the wind signal. So, I mean, the um, the origin of, of of liver zonation, like I said, uh, is to a large extent due to uh, to to localized wind signaling centrally, and and the way we understand why genes like um, glutamine synthetase, which is uh, you know, strongly sort of zonated, is that they interpret this, this wind gradient, I mean, ex exactly like in you know, developmental biology and, and uh, exactly like what, what people refer to as the, as the French flag model. I have to say, I thought one of the most striking slides was the, basically the one where you showed the histone RNA pole two. Oh, yes. In a accessibility uh, breathing video that you showed. I think that really got the message across very well. Uh, I was also thinking, having looked at that, uh, I mean, there's clearly a you know daily cycle, but what about things that are more long-term? It could be development, it could be aging, it could be maybe not so much seasonal in mammals, but what is the, uh, what is the long-term difference at the chromatin level? Is it DNA methylation? Well, so, I mean, uh, the, the, the processes that that cycle on a, you know, on a daily basis, so, so the, the sh let's, let's call those the short-term circadian kind of processes, they, uh, they seem not to use DNA methylation. So we've, 
you know, initially when we started looking at, at, at the chromatin states uh, maybe 10 years ago with, with chip and, and chip seek, we did also didn't really know what, what to expect. And, and actually we did experiments at some point to see if uh, um, there, there could be a rhythmic DNA methylation because uh, some of these enzymes, like one, some of these DNA methylases, uh, at least at the RNA level, were described as having a sort of, uh, you know, a circadian oscillation. But, but we, we then never found any convincing uh, evidence that, you know, there is uh, a cycling at the level of, uh, of DNA methylation. On the other hand, all the, the, the histone uh, uh, modifications, including methylation and acetylation, and, and uh, I mean, they, they clearly, uh, you know, uh, cycle uh, often along with, with transcription. I mean, okay, there's always this question of, of what is the cause and what is the consequence, uh, but, but clearly, I mean, this, this, this uh, histone uh, states are very dynamic on the 24 hour time scale. I think on much longer time scales, like, like you referred to, I mean, there, I think it's, it's known that, you know, some of these more permanent changes are, are also brought about by, by, by DNA methylation, but, uh, but in the circadian system, that seems uh, you know, not, not to be the case. If you look at it longitudinally, do you see the do you see any change in the amplitude of those uh, breathings of the modifications you looked at? Is you mean with, with, with age or, or? Yeah, I was just curious whether it's some sort of, could it be part of timekeeping in the long run? Uh, I mean, I think the, the how, you know, how the, how this rhythms parameter evolve with, uh, with uh, age, I mean, is, is, is currently, I think, uh, a very hot uh, sort of area of chronobiology. Uh, uh, we haven't really done experiments to, to look at that, but, but several people have. I mean, for example, at the, the University of Fribourg, uh, Jürgen Rippberger has looked at, at, you know, how these rhythms evolve with, with age. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, I'm not able to sort of comment on, on, on sort of yeah. the, the specifics. Um, so, I think Joe, Joe Takahashi at the meeting also had some some data on, on, on that, where he showed that you know, uh, basically, inflammation related genes, but you know, we were induced with 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 age and and metabolic related genes uh, were, were, were decreased, but that was sort of then differential depending on, on the type of diets uh, that, that uh, right. the animals uh, experienced. Yeah. So what I would like to do, I mean, I could speak to four hours because I actually used to work on gene regulation before. So that's some sort of time limitation. So what I'll do is maybe do a lightning round of a few questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's, that's good. So uh, in your talk, you talked about the uh, DNA accessibility, nuclear proteomics, single cell RNA-seq. So would it be fair to say that you are working towards a more general model of gene regulation and circadian? Yeah, I think that's totally uh, what we're doing, right? I mean, we, we've tried to actually inter interrogate, you know, the, the system uh, along the entire a uh, sequence of, of gene expression events, you know, starting in, in the nucleus and, and uh, the chromatin. And, and we also uh, did quite a bit of, of, of ribosome uh, profiling and looking at the translation. Um, what we haven't done ourselves are uh, things like, you know, analysis of, of metabolomes, uh, but, but others have, have done that. But we've looked at, yeah, chromatin, uh, RNA, translation, and, and proteins. Do, does any one of the gene regulatory steps stand out or they all contribute to similar effects? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on at the level of, of transcription. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, there's, 
then, then basically uh, an important question is how are these rhythms that we see at the level of transcription basically relayed, you know, down down the sort of sequence and, and uh, eventually uh, uh, affect the proteome and, and there I think we had a bit of a surprise initially because we the first experiment we did uh, with Fred Gachon is to do total proteome uh, analysis and that was in some sense, slightly disappointing because there was these sort of less rhythms, you know, that we were sort of used to seeing at the, the, let's say, RNA level. But in retrospect, it kind of makes sense because, you know, proteins are, are, are longer lived. Um, and yeah, perhaps the, you know, <laughs> the most important principle of chronobiology is that if you, if you have long half-lives, there's no chronobiology. Uh, because uh, you know you can only fluctuate on a certain time scale if, if your half lives are, are significantly shorter than this this time scale. Um, but so at the at the whole proteome level, I mean there were some interesting vignettes related to like secretion and things like that. But overall, it was a bit sort of you know flat for a chronobiologist. But then the surprise came when um, we looked at the, this nuclear proteome experiment that I showed because in in the in the in the nucleus it was just amazing uh, how, how much of these you know rhythms there, there were I, I would say actually the the nuclear proteome was the experiment with the the most uh, uh, you know amount of uh, with the highest amount of rhythms I've, I've seen so far yeah, and and that's regulated you know at the level of the the sort of nuclear import. So even though the total is sort of constant, you can sort of still generate, you know, rhythmic regulation by by, by acting on on the the the, the, the import, and and so yeah, I think uh, this is where we found a lot of of rhythms, uh, and I think that's sort of functionally very very relevant. So, it is a very difficult process to model. So it kind of begs the question, are there any, um, considering that you do high throughput work a lot, are there any good cell culture based systems that would help with the modeling? Where you can do high throughput analysis that you could plug in? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, we have uh, good cell lines, actually, where, uh, you know, uh, you can study uh, rhythmic gene expression. Uh, you know, the most famous are, are the, the NIH3T3 and the human uh, U2S cells. Uh, I mean, I think what's different in, in those cell lines compared to, you know, uh, tissue is that uh, in the tissue, like, or in a metabolic tissue, like, like the liver, there is this the core clock, but then there is a lot of, sort of physiological output functions that are sort of, you know, influenced by, by, by the clock. And the, in the cells, I mean, particularly in the 3T3 cells, this sort of layer of, of output is, is much sort of shrunk. So the, the core oscillator seems to tick, you know, very nicely, but there's not this, this sort of uh, layer of physiology that you can study. But to study the, the sort of mechanisms of the, the core oscillator, I mean, these cellular models have been very useful. And uh, you know, people like Steve Kay and John Hoganesh have, and, and Akim Kramer have pioneered this, this you know, uh, SI RNA type of screens yeah. that uh, allowed them you know, to basically identify new players and, and dissect further the, uh, the oscillatory mechanism itself. Um, a couple more quick questions. Uh, so are you thinking of uh, analyzing uh, any biobank type big data sets? Uh, looking at your model, looking at the potentially interesting genes or the circadian genes as a class and how the variation population might uh, relate to uh, the biology and perhaps the disease. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's actually a, an interesting sort of recent also uh, development that, you know, actually, I would say John Hoganesh has, has pioneered uh, 
which is to basically reconstruct temporal profiles, you know, from uh, from human uh, samples, and and he's done that. Uh, uh, actually in many different contexts, I mean, including things like, like the GTEx, you know, uh, collection of, of samples. Uh, and I mean, this actually is, is a very, I think, rich uh, uh, way or, you know, a very sort of nice way in which you can learn a lot about human, uh, human chronobiology because, the trick is, 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 is basically uh, to, to assign uh, time labels to, to biological samples that you know, were not initially labeled with time because they, they hadn't been taken in that sort of context. But there's so many of those you know, human samples out there is that looking at the collection of them, you can reconstruct rhythmic gene expression in, in a, you know, a given tissue or in a, in a given disease state. And, and you know that in in the context of cancer, for example, has, has uh, interesting uh, implications. You can see, you know, to what extent is is the, is, is chronobiology basically uh, modulated or, or disrupted, uh, depending on on what type of you know cancer you're looking at. Uh, and I think there's a lot uh, that that is going on currently in this, in this sort of direction. Um, and it's, it's, I, th I find it pretty exciting. I mean, we're now also sort of working on, on, on that uh, because it's, it sort of combines, you know, data and, and, and models. So it's because the way you basically reconstruct this, these cycles uh, requires quite interesting also, you know, models and, and present sort of interesting analysis challenges and, and how you do it and, and now with the kind of you know uh, approaches from uh, you know data science I think it, it it really brings a new sort of uh, angle uh, and, and on, onto these problems and I think that's going to be very exciting in the, in the coming years. It is very exciting it looks like uh, you know the large amounts of data generated from seemingly unrelated uh, experiments will help with the biological timekeeping, but the reverse is also true. A lot of potentially, you know, experiments might have timing as a confounding factor, and maybe over time, uh, it will be resolved in a much more productive manner. Yeah, I think that's 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 definitely true as well. Yeah. All right, Felix, uh, I think we'll have to end here. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Best of luck and thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. See you in the next meeting, maybe. Okay, sure. Okay, bye-bye.